everyone, welcome to Inside South Asia. I'm Bhairi Singh and if you are living in South Asia, then you are probably feeling the killer heat. Some parts of India and Pakistan touched 50 degrees and above this week. So tonight we look at the changing weather patterns, the forecast for the monsoon and when will there be any relief. Also on the show, South Asia's recurring fire tragedies. Who's responsible? Who's accountable? And why is Sheikh Hasina talking about a plot to carve out a Christian state? Here are the headlines. Out of focus, two major fires in India on a single day last week sent out shock waves with children and newborn babies forming a large chunk of the dead. The two incidents highlighted once again major lapses in safety norms that assume criminal dimensions. This factor has been behind a string of fire tragedies in India and across South Asia. Take a look. gruesome aftermath as fire and police officials search for survivors and more charred bodies. Flames had erupted at the two-story building in Rajkot, a gaming zone packed with around 300 people. Most of them were school children. 27 people were killed, nine of them school children. Many are still recuperating in hospital from the physical and psychological trauma. CCTV footage suggests the blaze ignited during welding activity and spread rapidly amid a clear lack of safety measures. The owner who fled has been nabbed. The centre's managers are being questioned. Two policemen and civic staff are among six officials suspended for negligence. It becomes one of many such cases already in the probe list. Then a second fire shocker hours later, this one in the national capital, Delhi. Here, seven newborns killed in a blaze in a newborn baby care hospital. Again, a story of safety norms flouted, expired licenses, unqualified doctors. This unit didn't even have fire extinguishers and emergency exits. For the patients and kin, a nightmare come to life. I want the baby care hospital authorities to be arrested. I want an investigation. Their licenses should be suspended. And the entire staff and the hospital's owner should be arrested. The owner of the hospital and a doctor are in police custody. Step back to the bigger picture. Rajkot and Delhi are only part of a deeper malaise from which lessons are hardly learned. Look at some recent ones. Ten workers killed in an explosion in a fireworks unit in Sivakasi in Tamil Nadu on the 9th of May. In April, seven killed in a blaze in a clothing shop in Maharashtra's Chhatrapati Sambhaji Nagar, suffocation stated as the cause of the deaths. In February this year, 11 workers were charred to death in a massive blaze at a paint factory in Outer Delhi's Alipur. In all of these, a common thread is a missing adherence to safety norms. Extend the malaise to Bangladesh. In the last seven years, nearly 3,000 people have been killed in over 173,000 fires across the country. At least 64,000, that's more than one-third, were caused by electrical short circuits. 
Fires in shopping malls, in residential buildings, in market areas and more have caused havoc. And here again, the common thread has been norms flouted and corruption from authorities who should ensure their implementation. Again, will lessons ever be learned? The other big story this week, human-driven climate change has caused some of the fiercest weather extremes across South Asia over the last couple of weeks. From a brutal heat wave in Delhi and northwest India hitting record peaks nearing the 50-degree threshold to cyclonic rainfall over eastern India and Bangladesh. It's quite a roller coaster ride. Take a look. The Indian capital doesn't know summer as harsh as this. Weather sensors at Mungeshpur in northwest Delhi claim to have recorded 52.9 degrees and citizens believed it. The Indian Met Office later clarified it was an error. Temperatures lurk near the 50 mark nonetheless. Churu in Rajasthan and Sirsa in Haryana have both crossed the 50 mark too. Over the past week, more than 37 cities in the country recorded temperatures over 45 degrees Celsius. It's far from over yet. The Indian Met Office says that the country is likely to experience longer and more intense heat waves this year. I am 70 years old and have never seen such scorching heat. This time it is hotter. It did not feel this hot earlier, but this year, it's the worst. If it continues like this, then it will be difficult for humans to survive. In neighboring Pakistan, Sindh and Punjab provinces are bearing the brunt of it. Compounded by energy shortages and power cuts, Mohinjadaro recorded 52.2 degrees Celsius. Business is down, heat-related illnesses are up and an ardent prayer to the rain gods is commonplace. Customers are not coming because of this extreme heat. I sit idly at the restaurant with tables and chairs and without any customers. I take bath several times a day which brings me a little relief. Also there is no power. The heat has made us very uneasy. Things run to another extreme in the east. Havoc caused by Cyclone Remal that hit the Bengal and Bangladesh coastline. Remal is believed to be one of the quickest forming and longest lasting cyclones to have hit Bangladesh. Nearly a million people were evacuated as fierce gales and crashing waves caused floods and triggered landslides inland. Manipur in India's northeast is badly hit. Thousands of homes stand destroyed, sea walls smashed and cities flooded across the two countries. Survivors narrated a tale of unprecedented fury and anger. This cyclone is more dangerous than the previous ones. There was rain and the wind speed was 120 to 130 kilometers per hour. We struggled to even go to the shelter center with my family. I've never seen something like this cyclone before. So much for the immediate damage and havoc. There are long-term effects in store, far more dire as per predictions. For the archipelago of Maldivian islands in the Indian Ocean, a matter of life and death. An alarming rise in sea levels has given rise to predictions of doomsday. A study says 80% of the Maldives would be unhabitable by 2050 and by 2100 it would have drowned completely. The dangers ring louder and louder by the year. Don't ignore the environment is the bigger message as it threatens harder than ever.
Now, what is it like for children growing up in a country that's been at war for four decades? That's the story of Afghanistan. Mines and explosives laid and forgotten over vast areas means a threat lurks at every step, and many have paid a heavy price. Here's more. Consider 13-year-old Ahmed Saeed lucky. Shrapnel from a mine he and his brother found on a field in their village in Ghazni province entered his arms and legs. Ahmed's brother, 11-year-old Taha, his playmate, had died of his injuries on the spot as the mine exploded. I miss my brother. I want our village to be cleared of mines and explosive ordnance. Today, my brother got martyred. Next time, other people must not get martyred and killed. Ahmed's story is the tip of a huge and ugly iceberg. With the return of the Taliban and the end of the insurgency, Afghans have been able to return to fields, schools and roads. But with the new peace came the danger of remnants left behind after 40 years of conflict on their land. Nearly 900 people were killed or wounded by leftover munitions from January 2023 to April this year, according to the UN. 82% of those killed or wounded by the remnant weapons since January 2023 were children. More than half the cases involved children playing on village fields. The biggest cause of injury is from playing and that's playing with things that people find lying around on the ground, which happen to be explosive remnants of war. The reason that's happening is because there has been so much fighting in this country. So there's a lot of things lying around for people to pick up that they shouldn't pick up. The other cause is collecting metal for scrap, and that's driven by poverty. People need money, and therefore they'll go to great risk to pick things up in order to make some money. The cleanup operation. Here, the mine action section of the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan places sandbags on a mine before detonating it to ensure it causes minimum damage. The agency that has been operating since 1988 has roped in NGOs to educate on the dangers. A halo rust mine danger awareness class underway in a school in De Ghazi Ahmada village. Warnings are extended against touching shiny objects. The Soviet era butterfly mine, for example, with its winged shape, is very attractive to pick up. We do not go to the places where the stone is blue. We know that it is dangerous. And we go to the places where the stone is white because we know that those areas are not dangerous. For Afghanistan's Taliban rulers, it's a dose of the same medicine they themselves inflicted on the country down the years, besides several other regimes. A lesson that says the horrors of war just go on and on. No nation is a bigger symbol of that, perhaps, than Afghanistan. Now let's take a look at what else is making news across South Asia. Now in a significant moral victory for Imran Khan and his supporters, a court in Pakistan has acquitted the former Prime Minister in two cases related to the May 9 the riots last year, citing insufficient evidence. Following Imran Khan's detention on corruption charges last year, his supporters had vandalized public property, including several military installations, in widespread protests across the country. The drama followed months of political crisis during which Khan, who was ousted in April 2022, waged an unprecedented campaign against the then government and establishment. The riots also led to the deaths of at least eight people and injured several others, prompting the authorities to arrest thousands of PTI workers and followers 
Despite his acquittal, Khan is likely to stay in jail as he faces multiple legal cases on corruption and conspiracy charges. And the Maldives has decided to launch India's payment service Rupay. While no date is fixed yet, Male says it will bolster the Maldivian Rufia. Uh, the development comes amid strained bilateral ties between the two sides. However, the recent visit by Maldives foreign minister has aimed to reset ties. The Maldives Minister of Economic Development and Trade, Mohammed Said, said India and the Maldives agreed to use their local currencies for bilateral trade to reduce reliance on the US dollar and improve regional financial integration. And the Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, who secured a fifth overall term as Prime Minister in January, has claimed that she was offered a hassle-free re-election if she allowed a foreign country to build an airbase in Bangladeshi territory. Hasina did not name the country but said the offer came from a white man. Going a step further, Hasina said, and I quote here, like East Timor, they, were, they will carve out a Christian country, taking parts of Bangladesh and Myanmar with a base in the Bay of Bengal. And Russia has said it was moving to remove the Taliban from a list of banned terror organizations three years after they returned to power in Afghanistan. Russia's state media confirmed the Taliban have also been invited to Russia's biggest annual economic forum and now actions that could further boost diplomacy between Russia and Afghanistan but would fall short of an official recognition of the Taliban government. Lavrov said Russia's decision to recognize the Taliban matched the realities on the ground. As well as the establishment of the Chennai Vladivostok. Let's take you to Nepal now, where a unique beauty contest has given a platform to the transgender community. The recently held event was just another step towards empowering the LGBTQ community in the Himalayan nation. The preliminary round to rigorous mentorship sessions. Eighteen transgender contestants took part in Miss Pink Nepal 2024, held recently in Kathmandu. The event celebrated progress and empowerment of the LGBTQ plus community in the Himalayan nation. Today, more media has arrived and I believe they will showcase our positive aspects as well as our talent. I'm hopeful that this will change the way society views our community. This pageant is similar to Miss Nepal or Miss World for transgender women like us. I joined the pageant for my self-grooming, confidence and leadership skills. Anmol Rai was crowned the winner, Sarosi Neopane and Arohi Basanet secured second and third positions. Rai will represent Nepal at the Miss International Queen 2024 competition in Thailand. Nepal has some of South Asia's most progressive laws on homosexuality and transgender rights. Landmark reforms passed in 2007 prohibit discrimination based on gender or sexual orientation. Miss Pink Nepal 2024 comes as a shot in the arm for them. It's a medium to empower our community, to bring about change in society and to end discrimination in our community. There is a movement going on at both the national and international levels and we are supporting this movement with today's program. Nepal's Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage in 2023, becoming the first country in South Asia to do so. Even in India, the country's top court has deferred the decision to parliament. Miss Pink Nepal held to mark the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia and Transphobia on the 17th of May. A much-needed platform voicing the rights of LGBTQ plus community, leading by example towards building an inclusive society.
And that's a wrap on our show. But before we go, people in Kashmir defied the soaring temperature and celebrated the spring festival of uh, Rohan Posh when people go fishing in the water using traditional wicker baskets and mosquito nets to clean the water bodies. Take a look at these visuals. I will see you next week. This festival is celebrated on 500 springs in the area. You can see how many people have come here with their baskets to fish. People of all ages take part in this festival. People also come here to watch. Fishing helps clear and clean the spring.